Welcome to Preeminent Test Prep. Today is day 40 in our 90-day SAT prep series. Today we're going to be working from uh, SAT practice test 5 for the math no calculator section. Today we're going to spend uh, about 25 minutes on that and then we're going to switch over and do the SAT writing section for today. So today's total is going to be pretty close to an hour, uh, maybe a little bit shorter. So what we're going to be doing today is uh, today you're going to be taking the SAT practice test 5 math no calculator section and you're going to time yourself uh, or rather I'm going to time you for 25 minutes. Okay, so we're going to be simulating it uh, basically like it was a practice test, but we're only going to be doing this section. So I'm not going to be actually teaching anything with the math calcu math no calculator or math with calculator section today. It's simply going to be you taking this SAT practice test 5 math no calculator section. Now I know if you're following our course, you took SAT practice test uh, 5 a couple weeks ago. So what this is really giving you an opportunity to do is see A, your growth. So see if you've gotten better and have improved. B, how well you're doing at analyzing your practice tests, because since you've taken this practice test before, you should be able to score very, very highly um, on this. You should be able to get 100%, hopefully, because you should have been able to learn from your mistakes before. So what this is giving you an opportunity to do is see your growth and then see if you need to be uh, working harder on analyzing your practice test results. Because if you don't score 100 on this, then that means you need to make sure that you're going over the questions you got wrong more often from your practice test because you took this practice test before. So if you don't score 100 on this, then you need to make sure that you go back, look at the questions you got wrong, and make sure you understand them now. Okay, because it's very, very important that we make sure we're analyzing the practice test that we take to understand what we got wrong because that's the whole reason that we take them, or at least part of the reason. It's not the whole reason, but it's a significant part of the reason. Okay, so after you do this, uh, you're going to spend some time with me on the SAT writing section, and that I'll actually be teaching you that today, right? That's not just going to be a timed thing. Um, just for today, just for today, you're going to be doing a timed math, no calculator section. It'll be 25 minutes. Treat it like the real thing. Don't use a calculator. Uh, see how many you can get right. You're going to have to pull this up on your own, so I got the practice test linked in the, linked in the description. So click on that. Um, open the PDF. Print it off if you'd like, or you can work off the PDF. I'd recommend printing it off, uh, but it's up to you. So that's SAT practice test five, the math no calculator section. So I will start a timer and uh, that timer, it's not gonna appear on screen, right? But what you will see is you'll see something that, a message that says uh, uh, the time has started. Um, when the 25 minutes is up, that's when I'll jump back in and I'll say, okay, your 25 minutes is up. And then I'll announce that you should just uh, put your answers um, somewhere for tomorrow. And then tomorrow what'll happen is tomorrow I will go over the answers. Um, basically what I'm gonna be doing is I have a video out already on SAT practice test five, the math no calculator section. So I'm just gonna be plugging that video in for tomorrow's math section before we go into the reading section for tomorrow. So I'll basically have a brief introduction uh, and then I'll plug that video in. So you'll see that video um, embedded into tomorrow's full like 50 or 55 minute video. That video will be embedded into it. Um, so yeah, with that, uh, basically what's gonna happen here is I'm basically gonna give a countdown from three to one. Um, at that point, go ahead and start and then um, if you don't have your materials up yet, then go ahead and get those up. And then when I say three, two, one, that's when I'm going to start the 25 minutes. You'll see a message pop up on your screen saying the time has started. And then once that 25 minutes is up, then I'll pop back in, tell you the time is up and tell you to put your answers somewhere for tomorrow so that we can go over them. Make sure you keep your work as well so you can see your work. Um, and then you will go ahead and switch to the writing section for today. And then tomorrow you will see a video going over the answer explanations. So anything you got wrong, you can see how I'm doing it. Um, and that should help you there. And then tomorrow we'll also have the reading section uh, where I'll go over a passage and try to teach you more on how to strategize for the reading section as well. Uh, so with that, I'm going to count down from five. So we're going to have five, four, three, two, one. You may start now.
Okay, your time is up for the SAT Math No Calculator section from Practice Test 5. So at this point, take your work and your answers, keep them tucked away somewhere for tomorrow. Tomorrow the video will go over the answers to that, the answer explanations, why the correct answers are correct, how to get there, and all of that tomorrow. So you'll be able to see your growth from when you first took SAT Practice Test 5 uh, to now, and that will help you make sure that you're really getting the most out of your practice test. Because if you missed any questions, then that means that you need to make sure that you're taking more time to analyze your practice tests after you take them to make sure that you know why you're getting answers wrong and how to get to the correct answer in the future. Okay, because that's very, very important. So with that, let's go ahead and switch over to our other section for today. All right, for the writing section today, we'll be working from SAT practice test two. We're gonna be doing the first two passages, so that'll be questions one through 22. Today, we're gonna be focusing on accuracy once again. So we're gonna make sure that we're really trying to teach you what to look for as far as tips, tricks, strategies, patterns, uh, setups, everything like that. Uh, really try to get you in the mind of someone who scored perfectly on the writing section back to back uh, SATs, really trying to help you see what I look for, uh, things that I use to help me succeed on the SAT writing section. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, make sure you have a notebook out because I will say things uh, as far as strategies that could be definitely helpful for the SAT writing section. So it could certainly be helpful to put those in your notes. All right, so with that, let's get started. So we have librarians help navigate in the digital age. In recent years, public libraries in the United States have experienced, uh, this is gonna be reductions, okay? We wouldn't say reducing because they haven't experienced reducing in their operating funds. They've experienced reductions in their operating funds. Okay, so that one right there, answer there would be B. We wouldn't say that they have experienced deducts or have experienced deducting, okay? They have experienced reductions in their operating funds, okay? Experience here is a verb. We don't wanna have two verbs next to each other, okay? Experience and reducing would be both verbs. Same if we were to, were to say deducting, those would both be verbs. We wanna say a verb and then not another verb, okay? So those are wrong as far as uh, D versus B. We would say they've experienced reductions, not deducts, okay? Because deducts is also a verb, okay? So only option there that isn't a verb is B. B is our correct answer. Okay, next thing I see is I see I have one word at the beginning of the sentence followed by a comma. Anytime I see I have one word at the beginning of a sentence followed by a comma, I know I'm looking at um, transitioning between my previous sentence to my new sentence or linking my previous sentence to my new sentence. So in order to do that, I have to read my new sentence. So I see I have library staffing has been cut by almost 4% since 2008 and the demand for librarians continues to decrease even though half of public libraries report that they have an insufficient number of staff to meet their patrons' needs. Okay, so that's talking about how we're cutting library staff. Um, now, before, in the previous sentence, we talked about cuts uh, on funding for uh, libraries. Okay, so if we're talking about cuts in funding for libraries and now them having to reduce their staffs, then that's going to be as a result of that drop in funding. Okay, and since it's as a result, we would say consequently, because consequently means as a result. So two, our correct answer there would also be B. Okay, previously, no, it's not something that happened before it. Uh, we're talking about a causal relationship where one is a result. So as a result of right? It would be as a result, which is consequently. So correct answer there is B. All right, now we've got employment in all job sectors in the United States is projected to grow by 14% over the next decade, yet the expected growth rate for librarians is predicted to only be 7% or half the overall rate. This trend combined with the increasing accessibility of information via the internet has led, okay, that's perfect, no change there. Okay, what is this testing? Well, this is testing a couple things. It's testing our tense, right? We have to know what tense we're in. Uh, in this case, we are in the um, which has, or the, this trend has led some to claim that librarianship, okay, this is going to be, uh, this is the correct tense, right? And we actually look at this, uh, this really isn't necessarily actually a tense question, so I actually take that back, okay? This is not a tense question, this is a number question, right? I thought it was going to be a number and a tense question, but actually it's not a tense question, it's really just a number question, okay? In this case, it's making sure that we understand that combined with the increasing accessibility of information via the internet, making sure we identify that as a non-essential phrase or clause. So that way we know we have to refer back to this trend when matching number to our verb has, okay? So since we have this trend, that's singular, so we have to have our singular verb has, so we can't have have, right? We wouldn't say this trend, which has some to claim that librarianship is in decline as a profession, uh, because that would make it a dependent clause, right? We don't want to include the which right here. So correct answer there is going to be A. Right? We wouldn't say this trend, which has led some to claim that librarianship is in decline as a profession, because then uh, that which have or which has would become a dependent clause and we would have no independent clause left. So that would be incorrect. So three answer there would be A. As public libraries adapt to rapid technological advances in information distribution, librarians' roles are actually expanding. The share of library materials that is in non-print formats. Now I'm asked if we should include this. In order for me to know if I should include something, I usually want to read on and finish my sentence. 
All right, so in non-print formats is increasing steadily. In 2010, at least 18 and a half million eBooks were available uh, for circulation. We wouldn't say for them to circulate because we already know that those uh, for them is the librarian, so we don't want to repeat that. So we would just say 18 and a half million eBooks were available for circulation. Okay. Otherwise, we're repeating unnecessary information if we were to say they're circulating. Also, that that's not grammatically correct or to be circulated by them. That's wordy. We already know that them is the librarians. We don't need to say that. We can just say for circulation. Okay, for circulation. That's the most efficient way to do it. I talked in the beginning in that first week about using concise word choice and efficient word choice. And this is the most concise and efficient way to say it would be for circulation. We have no unnecessary information there at all. So that's the best way to do it there. So five answer there would be D. Okay, now we can go back and answer four. Okay, we see that we're talking about um, librarians having digital information. Uh, at this point, should we add in the fact that it's ebooks, audio, video materials, and online journals? So obviously, it's adding it in as a non essential phrase or clause because we have two M dashes. So, should we add that? What well, we should because it's providing specific examples of the materials we are discussing in the sentence, right? We talk about how we have 18 and a half million ebooks, right? We talk about how the share of library materials that are non print formats, right, such as these, okay, is increasing steadily. So it's providing those specific examples of what we're talking about in the sentence, so we do want to add it there. So A would be correct for number four. All right, now we got question six. So let's go ahead and work our way down there. Uh, we have, as a result, librarians must now be proficient curators of electronic information. Then we have compiling, and then this is going to have to be cataloging and updating these collections. How did I know it was going to be cataloging? Well, I immediately recognized this was going to be a parallelism question. How did I do that? Okay, and the only reason that I paused there is just because I wasn't really sure the best way to kind of uh, teach this. I knew right away it was going to be a parallelism question, right? How did I know that? Well, I knew I saw that I had a uh, continuation of verbs, right? I have a list of verbs. I have compiling and I have updating, okay? So I also have catalog here that has to be cataloging to maintain that parallel endings, right? That ing ending that we have an updating and then compiling has to also apply to cataloging. So correct answer there has to be cataloging. Uh, so answer there is going to be D for number six. Okay, so that one right there is really just a parallelism question, making sure you identify you need parallel verbs there, right? Verb, 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 we need to have the same endings. Maintain that tense, right? Maintaining tense. All right, but perhaps even more importantly, librarians function as first responders for their community's computer needs. Since one of the fastest growing, li growing library services is public access computer use, there is great demand for computer instruction. Now I'm asked to combine two sentences. When I'm asked to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read my two sentences, and then I'm going to work from my shortest answer choice to my longest on my answer choices over here. Find which one uh, matches what I think should occur and find which one has two things. It is grammatically correct, grammatically correct, uh, grammatically correct. And then the second thing I look for when combining sentences is it's sequentially correct, right? When I say sequentially correct, I mean the things happen in a logical order, right? Happen in a logical order or the relationships occur in a logical order. All right, so we have, in fact, librarians training now includes courses on research and internet search methods, many of whom, okay, obviously that's referring to librarians, so I'm gonna want uh, this right here, this many of whom teach classes in internet navigation, database and software use and digital information literacy. Liter literacy, I'm gonna want that to modify my librarians, so I'm gonna want it by that librarians part right there. Okay, so we have, uh, we're going to find our shortest option and start there. We see our shortest option is going to be probably C, it looks like. Then we'll go to B. Then after that, we go to D and then to A. Okay, so C, training now includes courses on research and internet search methods. And then I have a semicolon. Many librarians, in fact, are teaching classes. Okay, that's out of order. Okay, I want to talk about how we have librarians um, who are, who are, uh, teaching these classes, right? But I really want to talk about that from, hang on a minute, let me just quick check something. Okay, I want to talk about that from, uh, I need that training to be applied to the librarians, okay? In this case, in C, that training isn't showing that it's the librarians receiving that training. We just say training includes courses on research and internet search methods. But who is getting that training? We don't know, so that's unclear, so that's why that one's wrong. Okay, our next one that was the shortest is B, so let's take a look at that. In fact, many librarians whose training now includes courses on search and internet methods, or on courses on research and internet search methods. Okay, that works perfectly because it's telling us who's receiving this training. It's those librarians. Okay, and obviously it's non essential because we have it offset by two commas. So then we'd have, in fact, many librarians teach classes in internet navigation, database and software use, and digital information literacy. 
That's perfect. It's efficient. It's grammatically correct. It has the correct uh, sequential order of these librarians who are receiving the training. So it tells us who's receiving the training, which is perfect. That was the problem with C. It didn't tell us who's receiving that training. Uh, so B solves all of our problems there. B is perfect. B is our correct answer. All right, so that was question seven. Now we got question eight. So we're going to work our way down there. So we've got, well, these classes are particularly helpful to young students, but de developing basic research skills. Okay, right here I have a comma. I see I have but, so I want to make sure I have a, a uh, well, I'm just going to quick check. So it's, all right, so I see it's and for or deleting the underlined portion. So that means that I know I'm probably going to have uh, an independent clause after it, and I just want to know which word, which fanboy I want to transition with, right? I have adult patrons can also benefit from library assistance. I know that's going to be an independent clause. I have an independent clause or a dependent clause before it. Okay, so I have a dependent clause. I want to connect that with a comma before I start with my ind independent clause. Okay, so I can delete it. That is possible. But let's see if we need if we want to have that but because it's providing an effective transition. So we have while well, these classes are particularly helpful to young students developing uh, basic research skills. I wouldn't say but adult patrons, okay? And here's why. Let me explain this a minute. We wouldn't say but adult patrons because those adult patrons aren't in, like aren't in contrast to these young students, okay? We have young students who are benefiting from these classes, okay? We wouldn't say but adult student adult patrons also benefit. Okay, because it's not contrasting. Okay, that's an addition basically. Okay, now we wouldn't <clears throat> we wouldn't also say and or for. Okay, because once again, like I said before, we have a dependent clause before this, so we don't need to have a fanboy there. Okay, we don't need to have a fanboy. If we have a dependent clause before an independent clause, all we want to do is just connect it with a comma. Okay, unless there was some some very very good reason to include a fanboy there, uh, which I don't think there is, and I don't think there ever really will be. Anytime we have a dependent clause before an independent clause like this, just put a comma, no fanboys needed, okay? So answer there is going to be D. So we're going to have D for number eight. Okay, if we have a dependent clause before an independent clause, we're just going to connect it with a comma after the dependent clause and then go straight into our independent clause. We don't need to have a fanboy there, so that is unnecessary. So I'm sorry if that was a bit confusing. I started off a little bit, uh, I didn't explain that super well, but I think that I I think you get the picture now after I took a little bit more time with number eight. All right, number nine, which choice most effectively sets up the examples given at the end of the sentence? Okay, well, we need to know what examples are coming at the end of the sentence. So we have uh, this right here, which we haven't decided if that's right yet. Now we have public libraries and librarians are especially valuable because they offer free resources that may be difficult to find elsewhere, such as help with online job applications or searches, as well as rem resume and job material development. Okay, those are all things that would help people get jobs. So I'd be looking for something like B. During periods of economic re recession, these libraries are very, very important, right? Because it's talking all about how things that can help people get jobs, which would be very, very important during a period of economic recession. So that's setting up those examples that are given at the end of that sentence. So for nine, correct answer there is going to be B. Uh, B. Okay, so we've got nine. Now we go ahead and move on. Now we've got 10. Okay, so we have... Uh, an overwhelming number of public libraries also report that they provide help with electronic government resources related to income taxes, law troubles. We wouldn't say that. Uh, that's not, uh, that's way too casual, okay? We want to say this professionally, which would be legal issues, okay? Concerns related to the courts, that's wordy. Same with matters uh, for the law courts, that's also wordy. A was just not, that's just not how we say it. We say legal issues, okay? This is kind of maintaining an academic tone, and if we're going to do that, we'd say legal issues. So B would be our answer for 10. All right, question 11, which choice clearly ends the passage with a restatement of the primary claim? Okay, our primary, our primary claim is that these librarians are providing uh, new skills, are teaching new, new skills to people in this digital age, right? They're not useless, they are important still. So we have in sum, the internet does not replace the need for librarians. Librarians are hardly obsolete. So we're going to look for an answer here that really talks about them playing a crucial role uh, even in this modern age. So let's look at option A and we'll just go down A through D. So we have like books, librarians have been along a round time, but the internet is extremely useful for many types of research. That's not touching on how these librarians are being um, important as far as their new role uh, working with the internet. Uh, so now we have option B, although their roles have diminished significantly, librarians will continue to be employed for the foreseeable future. That's not the primary claim. The primary claim is that they are uh, working with this electronic uh, devices and such in order to provide a new experience that is improved and helps people. So we have option C, the growth of electronic information has led to a diversification of librarian skills and services. That is a main, poke, I'm sorry, a main focus of our passage, right? Them adopting uh, to this new era of digital technology and them taking on these new skills and positioning them as savvy resource specialists for patrons, right? 
that's a perfect example of what our primary claim is. We're talking about how these librarians have gained new skills uh, that they're using to help their patrons. That's perfect. Okay, so C would be our correct answer for 11. All right, now we got our second passage. I'm gonna quick make sure we answered all of them up here. Just take a quick glance, make sure we got all of them answered, and then we'll move on. Okay, I see we do. So now we got our second passage. So we've got tiny exhibit, big impact. Okay, anytime I see a one up top like this, it means I'm placing a paragraph. You won't see that very often, in my opinion, on the SAT writing section, okay? It's very, very rare, in my opinion, um, but it's possible it could happen. So I'll teach you what I would do if I saw that. I'm gonna go down to the last part of the passage because that's usually where I'm gonna be asked about uh, my paragraph and where it should be placed and which one needs to be placed. I see in this case, I'm placing paragraph two to make the passage most logical. So what I do then is I go to paragraph two, I read it, and I answer any questions that are specific to grammar, right, that aren't specific to the rest of the passage. I'll answer that as I read it, and then when I'm done reading it, I'm gonna find something that tells me where it should be placed. So off the bat, I see viewing the exhibit, so I know I need to state an exhibit an exhibit before it, or talk about an exhibit before it. Okay, and then we say, I was amazed by the intricate details of some of the more ornately decorated room. I marveled at the replica of a salon, formal living room, dating back to the reign of French uh, King Louis, the whatever number that is. Um, and then we're asked if we should add this following sentence. Uh, this one, we actually can go ahead and answer because we see it says, some scholars argue the excess of King Louis XIV's reign contributed significantly to the conditions that result in the French Revolution. We see that we're just talking about a living room, right, and a decoration and an exhibit. So that French Revolution detail is really irrelevant here. Okay, so we're not going to want to add this. We can get rid of the two yeses. So we're going to say no because it's interrupting the paragraph's description of that miniature salon. Okay, we wouldn't say no because it implies that the interior designer had political motivations because it doesn't. So that's just factually incorrect. So C will be our correct answer for 15. All right, so now we've got um, to keep going on. So we've got built into the dark paneled walls, our bookshelves stocked with letter bound volumes, the couch and chairs, in keeping with the style of the time, are characterized by elegantly curved arms and legs. Okay, I have a comma, but then I see I have the word they. Okay, I can't have that because then I have an independent clause following that comma, which can't be because what came before it was also an independent clause. All right, and I can't connect those with only a comma and no fanboy. So that's going to be wrong. I know that. So A, no change is wrong. Now, what have I said when I when I talk about how if we have a subject after a comma, we want to get rid of it, right? So that's once again what we're going to look to do here. We're going to get, look to get rid of that subject, right? So if we take a look at this, we have the couch and chairs in keeping with the style of the time, which is non-essential, so we don't have to consider that. The couch and chairs are characterized by elegantly curved arms and legs. And then we've got uh, our covered in luxurious velvet, okay? Well, our covered in luxurious velvet is referring to these arm, curved arms and legs, so we don't want to repeat they. Okay, we don't need a comma to split it up either. We would just say, um, are characterized by elegantly curved arms and legs and are covered in luxurious velvet. Okay, now we don't need a comma. Okay, so we can get rid of that and we would just be left with a C. Okay, we wouldn't want to repeat couch and chairs because we already said that, so that would be redundant. Uh, we don't want to repeat they because that's redundant, so that's why A is wrong. Why is D wrong? Well, if we were to do D, we would have a comma and then are covered in luxurious velvet, but we don't want to split that up, right? We want it to be obvious we're referring to these curved arms and legs that are covered in luxurious velvet and if we put a comma there we're not doing that that's an unnecessary comma and we don't want to include unnecessary comma so correct answer for 16 is going to be c okay we don't need to put a comma in there that's unnecessary okay a dime sized portrait of a french aristocratic woman hangs in golden frame okay so the big thing i got from this is we need to be talking about an exhibit before it okay so that's where i'm going to look to place it is after we talk about an exhibit so now we go back to the top and we just read through First time I visited the Art Institute of Chicago, I expected to be impressed by its famous large paintings. Okay, now I see I have a series of words followed by a comma, right? It's pretty much anytime I see one word or three words or two words followed by a comma at the beginning of a sentence, I know it's really having me try to link the previous sentence to the new sentence. So that's what I'll do. I got to read on to find out what my new sentence is about. I couldn't wait to view. And then I have painter George Sorrow. This painter is referring to George Sorrow, so there's no comma between it. We want to keep that noun phrase, painter George Sorrow, all together. Okay, so we don't want to split it up with a comma, so no comma there. Uh, so we have painter George Sorrow's 10 foot wide. Okay, he owns this 10 foot wide as Sunday afternoon painting, so we do not want a comma after it. Okay, there's no reason to have a comma there. We want to keep the fact that he owns that 10 foot wide painting um, together, so we don't want to split that up with a comma. Now he does own it, so he does need this apostrophe here. Okay, so we're going to look for something that gets rid of those commas. We see that that's answer choice D for 13. So 13, answer there is going to be D. All right, now we can go back and we can answer 12, right? He's talking about how he expected to go view 
uh, this 10 foot wide thing in its full size, this painting in its full size. Um, so that's really uh, showing us, for instance, or giving us an example of what he talked about in his previous sense. His previous sense, he said he couldn't wait to be impressed by the large paintings. Now he's describing a large painting he can't wait to be impressed by. That is a for instance or an example. So that would be our correct answer for our transition between those two sentences would be option B for number 12. All right, so now we move down. We're going to be on 14 now. So we have it took me by surprise then when my favorite exhibit at the museum was one of its tiniest. Okay, this is the wrong it's. This is a homophone question. Homophones are words that sound the same but are spelled different. Okay, it's in this case is uh, referring to the museum and the museum owning this tiniest exhibit, right? So it should not have an apostrophe at, between that T and the S. Uh, so we can get rid of anything with that apostrophe, which is going to be options A and B. Okay, now we have to decide if we want a colon or a semicolon after it. Okay, we can't use a semicolon because a semicolon needs two independent clauses and the Thorn Miniature Museums is not an independent clause. Therefore, I know my answer is going to have to be C, okay, because we're going to use that colon to emphasize the Thorn Miniature Rooms or introduce it. So correct answer for 14 is going to be C, okay, using that colon to introduce uh, the Thor Miniature Rooms. Okay, we haven't talked about an exhibit yet and I already covered uh, questions 15 and 16 that are there. So I move on to uh, part three or passage, or I'm sorry, paragraph three. Okay, now I say this exhibit. Okay, that's a sign that uh, paragraph two is probably coming after paragraph three, but I'm going to read on to make sure. So this exhibit showcases 68 miniature rooms inserted in the wall at eye level. Each furnished room consists of three walls. The fourth wall is a glass pane through which museum goers observe. The rooms and their furnishings were painstakingly created to scale at 1 12th their actual size so that one inch in the exhibit correlated with one foot in real life. If couch, for example, is seven inches long, now I'm asked to give a second supporting example, so it has to be different than the couch example. That's similar to the example already in the sense. So that would be something that's a household item, um, and we're showing that it's much, much smaller in scale on this, uh, this exhibit. So we have a couch, seven inches long, and that is based on a seven foot long couch. No, because that's repeating that same example. We need a new one. A teacup is about a quarter of an inch. That's perfect. It's another household item showing how small it is. Okay, we wouldn't say there are tiny cushions on some because we want to give a scale, right? It being a quarter of an inch. Household items are also on the scale. We've already stated that, so that would just be repetition and it's also not providing a second supporting example. So 17, answer there is going to be B. All right, we are pretty much, we've got like four more questions it looks like. Okay, so that really finished up our discussion, right? And then we say each room represents a different style. Okay, so we know that at that point we talked about that exhibit. So we know now we can place that second paragraph after viewing the exhibit, right? We just uh, we just described it, now we're describing viewing it, okay? So we're going to want two to come after three. So we're going to go down, find that question. It's going to be placed after paragraph three because in paragraph three, we talk about that uh, exhibit for the first time and now we're going to talk about viewing it after that, okay? So answer for 22 is going to be B. All right, so now let's go ahead and scroll back up to where we left off. I believe that was at question 18. Just to make sure, and it was, so let's go ahead and get going on that. Okay, we're asked to maintain or combine the sentences with the underlined portion. So we have the planar rooms are more sparsely furnished. Uh, their architectural features, furnishings, and decorations are just as true to the periods uh, they represent. Okay, that's a contrast, right? They're more sparsely furnished, okay, but, so we're going to do a comma here and then do but. Since we have an independent clause here and an independent clause here, we can connect them with a comma and a fanboy. So we would do comma but their architectural, so I guess we would keep there. So but their architectural uh, features, furnishings, and decorations are just as true to the period they represent. Okay, we wouldn't use a comma and whereas. Okay, we want to use a comma and but, and here's why. Okay, by using a comma and then doing but, what we're showing is that that contrast or that unexpected element, right? The unexpected element is the fact that they're sparsely furnished, uh, but yet still, in spite of being sparsely furnished, uh, they're very, very true to the periods that they represent. Okay, so it's showing that surprising element of this architecture in this planar room. Okay, so since it's surprising, we want to use but because that shows that surprise. Okay, it's also grammatically correct. So B is going to be our correct answer there. All right, now we go down. We got 19. One of my favorite rooms in the whole exhibit, in fact, is an 1885 summer kitchen. The room is simple but spacious with a small sink and counter along one wall. Okay, a, a cast iron stove and some hanging pots and pans along another wall. And a small table under a window of a third wall. Okay, I'm asked for what closely matches the stylistic pattern established earlier in the sentence. Okay, that pattern is the fact that we describe something and then we describe where it is in relation to a wall. Okay, we describe pots and pans against one wall. We describe a sink and a counter against a wall. So I want to describe another thing against a third wall. Uh, I see that option A, option A does describe something. 
uh, small table under a window of the third wall. So option A is perfect. I look at my other options. I see they end in window, end in table, end in window. So they're all going to be wrong because we want to end in wall to maintain that same pattern that we've developed there. So A would be our answer for question 19. That is essentially a parallelism, a parallelism question, not in the sense that it's maintaining verb tense endings, but in the sense that we want to maintain that parallel stylistic pattern structure. So 19, our answer there is going to be A. All right, now we've got, as I walk through the exhibit, I overheard a visitor. Okay, how do I know it's going to be a visitor and not visitors? Well, because it says A here, which indicates to me my visitor is singular. There's only one, which means I don't have visitors. Okay, a visitor can't own their remark. Okay, just think about it like this. If we we're going to say a visitor said, we wouldn't say a visitor's said. We would just say a visitor said. So we have to get rid of that apostrophe, get rid of the S, both of them. Okay, so that means we don't have B and we don't have A as an answer choice anymore. So we have a visitor remarked or a visitor remark. Well, I overheard a visitor remark. We wouldn't say I overheard a visitor remarked, okay, because we already have our verb here in overheard. Now, is remark a verb? Yes, it is, and so is remarked, but we wouldn't say I overheard a visitor remarked. We would say I overheard a visitor remarked, right? Just like we wouldn't say um, said it, okay? We wouldn't say said it if we we're going to say uh, John said something. We wouldn't say that. We would say uh, John said. We wouldn't say John said it, just like we wouldn't say John remarked, okay? We would say John remarked, okay? So visitor remarked. I guess John there wasn't really a great example to use, but either way, we wouldn't say I overheard a visitor remark. We would say I overheard a visitor remark. Okay, so correct answer there is going to be D for number 20. Okay, you know that grandfather clock actually runs. Its glass door swings open and the clock can be wound up. Okay, next, I see that I have no direction for 21, so I just got to read through my options. So I've dotted with pin size knobs another visitor. That's incorrect. How do I know that? Well, that's a misplaced modifier. Okay, a visitor is not dotted with pin size knobs. Okay, it's modifying the wrong thing there because there's no way a visitor is dotted with pin size knobs. Option B, another visitor dotted with pin size knobs. That dotted with pin size knobs cannot refer to another visitor. That visitor is not dotted with pin size knobs. C, another visitor dotted with pin size knobs. No, once again, it cannot be another visitor dotted with pin, with pin size knobs. Uh, now we have D, another visitor noticed my fascination with a tiny writing desk in its drawers dotted with pin size knobs. Yes, those drawers are dotted with pin size knobs. So our answer for 21 is D. All right, and then we already answered 22 being B, so that takes us through today's writing section. So as always, hopefully that was helpful. If it was, there'll be a donation link in the description when it's up and running. Any private SAT tutoring I'm doing will be linked in the description. Any private college admissions consulting I'm doing will be linked in the description. Uh, as always, make sure to like, share, and subscribe, and have a great day.